my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lifted up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message. We pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in chapter number 9. The book of Hebrews in chapter number 9. We are progressing quickly through the book of Hebrews and on, on the downhill slope. Finishing up, the book of Hebrews only has... 13 chapters. We are now reaching chapter number 9, and we're going to get to some more of the practical applications of the book of Hebrews. But remember, as we study the book of Hebrews, it is a study in what we call Christology, meaning the study of the life and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that the book of Hebrews is a New Testament commentary on the Old Testament. It takes an evaluation of the Old Testament through the light and filter of Jesus Christ, showing how these Old Testament pictures showed Jesus. Well, the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9, is the heart of this picture, meaning that it's going to take these elements that we see in the Old Testament and point to Jesus Christ. We've been going up to this place. We've been talking how Jesus Christ is better than angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua, better than Aaron. And now we've seen that Calvary is the better way and shown that Jesus Christ is the high priest. Well, in the Old Testament, the high priest is always associated with the tabernacle and temple. And so tonight, as we come to chapter number nine, we're going to see the pictures of the high priest and the pictures of the tabernacle and show how they point to Jesus. So if you don't mind, notice with me in the book of Hebrews chapter number nine. The book of Hebrews chapter number nine, and let's start in verse number one. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse 1, it says this, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant." And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the ta first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience." which stood only in the meats and drinks and diverse washing and of cardinal ordinances and posed on them unto the time of reformation. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Hebrews chapter number 9? The book of Hebrews chapter number 9, and notice with me in verse number 11. Hebrews 9 and 11, notice the phrase, a greater and more perfect tabernacle. A greater and more perfect tabernacle tabernacle. Of course, that greater and more perfect tabernacle was Jesus Christ, but the former tabernacle pointed to this greater tabernacle of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God, and thank you for these pictures that you showed us, and that even those in the Old Testament could understand to a degree that they were pointing to something beyond this physical building. We're thankful that it pointed to you, Jesus Christ, and what you did for us, and that your blood was enough. I'm asking as we open up this passage that we would learn more about you, and fall more in love with you, and be in awe of your wisdom, and your glory, and your grace. Again, I dare not trust my own. So once again, I surrender myself to you, trusting that your spirit would do a great work in tonight. As we show these pictures, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, inside of the Word of God, the subject that is mentioned the most, or there are more passages dedicated to this subject than any other in the Bible, would be the subject of the tabernacle temple. We know that the tabernacle was ordained of God, and there are more passages dedicated to the tabernacle, and then later on the temple, than any other subject. So with this, we have to understand that we have to place the emphasis where God places the emphasis. So if God places an emphasis on the tabernacle, that means because God wants to emphasize it. Now we understand, why did God spend so much time in the Old Testament talking about the tabernacle? Why was there such an emphasis when King Solomon put together the temple and followed it after the pattern of the tabernacle, just enlarged it? Why was there such a big deal of these things? Well, the book of Hebrews chapter 9 tells us the reason. Because they were a picture of someone yet to come. That all the elements of it was to picture the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God never intended for this to be the end all of the religion. It was meant to work with the Hebrew people to point them to something yet to come. And so with this, let's explore what the book of Hebrews says in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 concerning this tabernacle and then of course pointing it to Jesus Christ. The very first thing I'd like to show you is the picture of the furniture. The picture of the furniture. Now again, we have to place the emphasis where God placed the emphasis. And so because God places the emphasis on the tabernacle, there are certain things that every student of the Bible have to understand. And that is, one of them is the furniture of the temple, the tabernacle. Every Christian needs to have a working knowledge of this. That we know that leading into the tabernacle, we know that the tabernacle itself was divide, uh, set into two different rooms. You would have the holy and the holiest of holies. Before you reached the tabernacle, though, inside of the courtyard, you would have two pieces of furniture. The very first piece of furniture was the brazen altar. The brazen altar. It was here at the brazen altar that the animals were sacrificed as a picture that for the wages of sin is death. It was there to show the people of, of Israel because of their sin, there required a price. And here was not just a figurative or a poetic or a philosophy way of stating this, but there's something quite different to put your hand on a living creature and knowing that it is going to be put to death because you deserve death. There's something about touching it. For example, if we were to say, in Green Bay, we're setting up a brand new restaurant. A brand new restaurant. And in this restaurant, you get to meet your food before you eat it. 
And so let's say that your, your, your family is going to order some steak. So we would take you and let you meet Bessie and pet Bessie and say, All right, Bessie, this is Bessie. All right, we're going to turn her into steaks. We'll be right back. Or, or maybe you say, you know, I don't need a Bessie, but you know what? I need rabbit. So you get a touch little fluffy thump, thumper and pet him a little bit and say, all right, now we're going to go cook some rabbit for you. I just wanted you to meet what you're going to eat. Do you think that restaurant would fare well in our society that would probably not? Would, would people not want to eat there? Why? Because there's something about meeting your food before you eat it. There's something about that. So it's one thing to theologically or theoretically say, well, because you sin, something has to die. But there is something entirely different when you meet the creature that is dying in your place. To see that it's alive. To see that it is breathing. To see that it has life in it. And to know that life is going to be extinguished. Because I'm a sinner. And because my sin requires death. You understand this is a big deal. This was to put in mind. And remember the Hebrew people were required to do this once a year. They were to make the trek to come to the temple. No matter where they were at. To come and make this sacrifice. God did this on purpose to keep in their mind at all times. Every year to place an emphasis. Because of my sin, something has to die. For the wages of sin is death. This creature is going to die on my behalf. It was a very real thing. And again, God was trying to picture, hey, this was Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you. By the way, Jesus didn't die for us theoretically. Jesus Christ robed himself in flesh and he breathed. He hungered. He grew weary. He had friends. He wasn't some theoretical being. He was a real person. A real uh, person. Robed in flesh. Who lived the same life that you and I lived. And he died. Not theoretically. He died realistically for you. Someone died for you. This is a big deal. Now the next piece of furniture that would come to. Would be the brazen laver. The brazen laver was something that was filled with water. And after the priest would get done doing the sacrifices. They would come to the brazen laver. And they would wash themselves. Now as a picture. The altar pictured our sins being paid for. Our sin being paid for, for the wages of sin is death. Something died in my place. So why would the priest have to clean themselves if they are already clean from the price of sin? Well, because we live in a dirty world and we still have to take a bath. You don't take a bath once a year. I hope you don't. We're looking at teenagers now. You have to wash often. Especially in our day and age of 2020. You wash often. Alright. That's why the book of 1 John 1 9 is there. For the, the Bible says. <laughs> if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the picture that we see here. In this brazen altar. That even though our sins are covered. We still need to be clean. Before we go approach God. And before the priest would go into the actual temple. The tabernacle. They had to be cleansed before they could approach God. Well that makes sense too. If we're going to approach God. We need to be cleansed. Then when you walk inside of the uh, <coughs> temple. The uh, temple. Notice what it says in verse number 2. Uh, verse number 1. Then verily the first covenant also had ordinance of divine service. And a worldly sanctuary. Meaning that it was a, a service for God. But it was a worldly, you could touch it, sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first. Which was the candlestick. So as you first step into the uh, temple. On the left hand side. There would be a golden candlestick. 
And they, the priest had to make sure there was enough oil in it and had to make sure that it was lit and there was things they would do with this. Of course, the candlestick was a picture that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And verse number two, for there was a tabernacle made first that was of the t candlestick and the table and the showbread. So as you come towards the back, there would be a veil and there would be a table of the altar of incense. And there would be incense that would be going up representing the prayers going before God. And we know that Jesus Christ is always before the Father making intercession for us. Then on the back side... On the, as you step in towards your right, there's going to be a table and this would be showbread. And there was a special bread that was dedicated to God and set aside for his use inside of the tabernacle. And you say, well, God doesn't need to eat. Yes, remember, it was a picture. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so we could see this. They would have these set aside. Notice as it goes on in verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made first that was of the candlestick and of the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now, separating the two rooms was a veil. This veil was a hand's breadth uh, wide, meaning that not like the curtains that you have at home that allow some light to go through. This was like a big safety fire curtain. It was wide enough that it would be as wide as your hand and then stretch this whole distance. It was a big heavy curtain that you couldn't accidentally go through. It was a hard fast border that would prevent anyone from going through to the other side. Because on the other side was a room called the holiest of holies. Here it calls it the holiest of all. What's inside of there? Verse number four, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around with gold. So inside of it was the ark of the covenant, which was a picture of the presence of God. Now, what was inside of the ark of the covenant? There was a golden pot that had manna. Remember that God had brought manna supernaturally and that he was supernaturally fed his people day and night, year after year after year. That God is able to give us our daily bread. He's able to make us, give us those daily provisions. And that golden pot with manna was a reminder to the people of the miracle that God did of supernaturally supplying for them every day. Notice it also had Aaron's rod that budded. Remember we had covered that story that they had put all of the rods of all the heads of the people inside of the temple and only Aaron's rod budded. And you know what that shows us? That God is able to make life out of something that is dead. That is wonderful for all of us because he hath quickened us who were dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sin and he quickened us. He made us alive. He took something that was dead and worthless and he gave it life. Oh, what a wonderful God. And then the tables of the covenant. We would call this the Ten Commandments. God made sure the Ten Commandments was parked in it too because it was the law that was required to approach God. And by the way, the law still shows us what is required to approach God. Perfection and we cannot reach it ourselves. So for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It reminds us that God is a holy God. Now all of these were pictures. And each of the Hebrew people were to see these pictures. Can't you imagine some child going, Mom, what's inside of that tabernacle there? Oh, well, they said, well, there's a golden candlestick. Why do we have a golden candlestick? You understand, God put that there for a picture for the Hebrew people to kind of understand a little bit about approaching God. That God had given us the light to his path. These things were to show little pictures of Jesus Christ. Now, again, we had the privilege of having more information. But God gave them some information so they could look forward to the promises of God. We look back and see the completed work that God has done. But for the Hebrew people, God was trying to look them, 
and say, look forward. Look forward. I've got something coming. This is just a picture. This is something for you to look at so that way you can know there's something coming. There's something coming. So we could see these pictures of the furniture, these things that are found within it. Notice again in verse number 5. Over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The author, who I believe is Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, listen, if I start telling you all about the incursies, about the tabernacle, about the Ark of the Covenant, and all the other stuff, we're not going to get done with this. This is a whole different lecture. But let me tell you, I'm just telling you quickly what was in it, just as a reminder, but it's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to Jesus. Which as he goes on, because he wants to get to more of the heart of the matter of who this is picturing. The second thing I want to show you is the picture of the priest. The picture of the priest. So not only the picture of the furniture, but we have the picture of the priest. Notice with me in verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. Meaning, the priest went in and they were serving God. Whether it was taking care of the sacrifices or taking care of the showbread or doing these other things, the priest had their service that they were supposed to do to God. But notice this. But into the second, so we're talking about the tabernacle. It was divided into two rooms. The first room, uh, the holies, was where the rest of the priests, they could do their duties. However, on the second, the Holy of Holies, the second part of the tabernacle, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year. And this was called the Day of Atonement, not without blood for which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So no one was allowed beyond the Holy of Holies except for the high priest. And that was only once a year. And he could not go without blood. So here's what would happen. The high priest would take two goats. before Early in the morning he would take two goats. And they would draw lots. Basically they would pick off which one's going to win. By random chance. And the high priest would take the two goats. And to see which one was going to be sacrificed. And which one was going to be used later that day as a scapegoat. Now, once those were picked, which one was going to be sacrificed, which one was going to be the scapegoat, then a bullock would be sacrificed for the sins of the priest, meaning that he had to make sure that he was as right with God before he approached God. And so on this day of atonement, this would be a big thing. They would sacrifice this bullock. And then the priest would go in and sprinkle the blood at the mercy seat seven times. Then he would come out ceremonially clean and as a picture of Jesus who was perfect before God. So he would go in there and do this ceremony, sprinkle the blood. He would come out as a picture that now Jesus, who was perfect, who could stand before God. So he had to be right with God first. Then he now being in that representation of someone who could go before God would take the goat the goat that they had set aside before, and he would sacrifice the goat. Then he would take the blood of the goat and offer it, go back into the Holy of Holies and offer it as an offering for the sins so that the people could be forgiven of their sins. So here's the picture. So the high priest would go in and ceremonially be cleansed, come out as someone who was able to approach God. Then he would take the sacrifice of the sins of the people, take the blood, and with as someone who could approach a holy God, take the sacrifice of the blood, and ceremonially offer the blood to God so that the people would be forgiven of their sins. Well, that sounds like a pretty clear picture of something to come, doesn't it? Someone who is now able to approach God, bringing the blood offering so that way the people's sins can be forgiven. Then after this would be take place, he would exit out and not return into the Holy of Holies for a full year. 
Now the next part of the ceremony was public and more impressive. Before that, that was more private. But then he would go out and in front of all the people, he would take the other goat, the goat that wasn't sacrificed, and this would be called the scapegoat. By the way, this is where that word came in from our English language from this ceremony here. You've heard of a scapegoat before, someone who's blamed for all the problems. And so they would take this scapegoat and he would lay his hand on the goat and confess all of the iniquities, the sins of the children of Israel. And so it was a picture that all the sins would be laid upon that goat. Now this is where it gets good. In front of all the children of Israel, they watched this. Then they would take what was called a fit man. Someone who was qualified. And that fit man would take the goat and lead it outside of the encampment. Now remember, they're in the middle of the desert. He would take it outside of the encampment and let the goat goat go and make it run away from the camp. And that goat would be seen no more. Why is that important? That goat had all my sins on it. And now this, the goat is gone. We'll never see it again. And by the way, we'll never see my sins that was carried upon it anymore. It is gone as far as the east is from the west. Buried in the deepest sea. I'll never have that sin brought back to me again. Now, all of this was done as a picture of what Jesus Christ did for us. That Jesus Christ is the perfect one who is qualified to stand before God and offer a blood sacrifice to pay for your sins and mine. Amen. And then he took all of our sins and he put it and cast it away where it will never come and haunt us anymore. You'd almost think that God knew what he was doing, making all of these pictures. And these pictures, even though they did not clearly teach, uh, meaning that they didn't have all the doctrine of Christ, it was enough to teach the people there was a sacrifice for sin. And you can trust the promises that God made for you. There was enough for them to understand and accept the promises there. Which is a good time to remind you here that we saw the picture of the furniture. We saw the picture of the priest. Let me remind you now a third thing. A picture was just a picture. A picture was just a picture. What do I mean by that? Well, notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, meaning the Holy Ghost used all of this to show... Remember, the Holy Ghost is God. The Holy Ghost put this together for the purpose of showing Jesus. Notice this. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing. Why? Why was, uh, why was it that it, there was nothing enough? Because the first one was just a picture. It was not enough. It was just there as a placeholder, as a picture of something yet to come. Verse number 9, for which was a figure, again, another way of saying this was a picture, for which was a figure for the time then present in which offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So in verse number 9, what it is saying is that the blood of goats and bulls was not enough. Going through the actual ceremony was not enough. What do I mean by this? All right, so let's say the Hebrew family comes and that they are sacrificing this blood of uh, this goat. So they lay hands on it and the best they can, they're trying to get all of their sins on that goat. Is that something they were able to do? No. That goat was not literally taking their sins away. It was a picture. And so this was the problem. Were you trusting in the works or were you trusting in what it pictured? Does that make sense? You understand we still deal with this today. Uh, just a little side thing. There are some people that trust in a prayer. May I remind you, a prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. 
When we're praying, we're just accepting the gift. But if you're trusting in a prayer to get you to heaven, you're trusting in the wrong thing. Salvation is not a plan. It is a person. Does that make sense? So the, the blood of goats was not enough. It was the person it pointed to that was the one that saved him. Does that make sense? This is what it's speaking of here. That it could not make them that did the service perfect, make them complete or whole, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washing and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, what this is talking about is that the tabernacle was a holding place. Jesus Christ was going to come, but this was a way to put the picture and teach people that God is going to bring the promises during that time of the Old Testament. It was a way to say, listen here, this goat is not taking away your, your sins, but what it is doing is reminding us that for the wages of sin is death, that something has to die in our place. And we're trusting in God's promise that he's going to send a lamb to take our promise. Now, we don't know who that is. We don't know the details. All we know is that God made a promise. And this is a picture as a reminder that God made me a promise and we're trusting in what God said. I don't have all the details. I don't know how it's going to work out. All I know is what God said. And I'm trusting in the promise. This was a picture of things to come. It did not save them. It was a picture of things to come. These things did not ease a guilty conscience. So what did? Which brings me to the last thing here. The perfect picture. The perfect picture. We have the picture of the furniture. We have the picture of the priest. We have the idea that the picture was just a picture. Now we come to the perfect picture. How could the Old Testament saints be saved? That's a good question. Were they saved like you and I were? Yes. How are we saved, by the way? By faith or grace. God has given us grace and we're trusting by faith. What are we trusting in? We're trusting in the promises that God gave to us. We just happen to have more information. They look forward to the promises. We look in the past at what God has already done. Notice what the Bible has to say about this. Verse number 11. But Christ being come, an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. All of this was to pic picture the perfect tabernacle. That's Jesus. All of that other before, it was a picture. But it was all pointing to Jesus, who in his own body bore our sins. Who every part of the tabernacle pointed to Christ. And whereas the tabernacle was a fascinating study, and some say the only perfect building because its plans came directly from God, it was still temper, temporary. It was only a picture. It was a placeholder. Pointing up to the perfect one, Jesus Christ. Notice it again in verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus Christ was the greater and more perfect sacrifice. It was by his blood that paid our price. Over and over, we're going to see a great emphasis on the blood in the next chapter. In fact, Sunday morning's message is titled, The Blood. And it's going to place an emphasis here that blood of goats and calves and lambs never, never, never paid the price for sin. Never. It was always Jesus Christ's blood that was enough. All this was was a picture. It was a way to get the people to look to that. So the people were never supposed to trust that the blood of the goats was to pay their price. They were to always to understand this was a picture. Now unfortunately, many of them took to religion and they believed honestly and fervently and deeply that their, the blood of goats paid their price, but it did not. 
It was Jesus' blood that was the only one that was enough. And again, the rest of chapter 9 is going to place a big emphasis on this idea here. Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice. It was only by his blood, only by his blood that we received forgiveness of sins. Nothing else could do the job. Jesus' blood and Jesus' blood enough. Which brings me to this idea. What are you trusting in? We've already mentioned before that some people trust in a prayer. That I'm going to heaven because I said a prayer. I remind you again that Jesus Christ is the one that saves you, not a prayer. Maybe even some people take it personally and they say, I'm trusting in a plan. The Bible says this and praise the Lord. And so I'm trusting that if I do everything that the Bible says that I'm going to heaven. I understand what they mean, but let's perfect you a little bit. It's the person that gets us to heaven. Not a plan, not a ritual, not a certain way of saying thing. There's not a secret handshake and there's not a certain phrase. There's not a certain way you got to hold your hands and like your old rabbit ear uh, antenna and stuff that you have to get the right reception. It is a person that saves us. Now this is important because all of us tend towards religion. All of us tend towards something that we have to do ourselves to help God. We feel like we have to do something. Have you ever felt like that? People feel like that all the time in religion. So if I go to heaven, I have to help God. So baptism is added. So this is added. So this is added. But it is Jesus Christ and him and him alone. It is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I say this because I love you. I meet people all the time who grew up in a church, may even grow up in a church like this, but they're trusting in something else other than the blood of Jesus Christ. They say, because I'm a Baptist, Catholic, uh, Methodist, uh, Christian scientist, whatever else, I'm going to heaven. That is not enough. Some people say, well, because I'm a good person. Some people even dare to tell me because I keep the Ten Commandments. Let me tell you that even if you somehow manage to keep the Ten Commandments, it would still not be enough because you are still a sinner. You understand we sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We're sinners from birth. You sin because you're a sinner. And so if somehow, supernaturally, some way, a person lived without ever breaking the Ten Commandments, they still wouldn't make it to heaven. Because Jesus Christ had to pay not only our sin debt, but also the debt because we are sinners. Our very nature of who we are. And that was something that blood and goats could not have covered with their blood. What are you trusting in? Are you 100% sure, according to what the Bible says, are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven? Are you trusting in what God said? One of my favorite times of seeing someone come to know the Lord was a good friend of mine. I worked with him for years, five, six years. Finally, one day, I showed up to work early for the purpose of telling him more about Christ. He was working night shift. I was working early morning. And I got in before everyone else. And I said, listen, I've been telling you so much about heaven. And I want to ask you again, are, can I show you for sure how you can know for sure you go to heaven? And he surprised me and he said, yes. Great. So we went to the break room and I opened the Bible once again and I showed him these things from the Bible that according to the Bible we're sinners and because of our sin that we've offended a holy righteous God and he acknowledged that and I said according to the Bible we deserve hell. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe you deserve to go to hell? And for the first time he said yes I do. Yes I do. And then I said, let me tell you what the good news is, that God made you a promise in John 3, 16. Let me show it to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. I said, wherever it says world and whosoever, you could put your name in there. So read that for me and put your name in there. For God so loved and he gave his name that he gave his only begotten son that if I believe in him, I should not perish but everlasting life. I said, who's that promise to? He said, that's to me. I said, God said that if you would just believe, you could accept this gift right now, that you could have eternal life. Would you be willing to accept this gift right now? And he said, I would. I said, well, there's two ways we could do this. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That what you're supposed to do is ask God for it. So you could either use your own words and the best you know how you could ask God for it. If you want, I could go alongside with you and I could pray with you and I could say a little bit. And you could repeat after me. But we could ask for that gift together. Which one would work best for you? He says, would you help me? I'd be glad to. And so I said, let's pray. And so I led him through a, a prayer and we talked to God. And then afterwards I said, all right, who'd you just talk to? And he looked at me for a second and said, can we do it again? <laughs> Absolutely. And so we did it again. And afterwards, I asked him, who did you just talk to? And he said, I talked to God. Amen. I said, what would you ask him? I asked him to save me. I said, what did God say? Did he see absolutely not? No way. And he laughed. He, says, he said, yes. I said, you want to know how he, I know he said yes. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish or go to hell, but have everlasting life. Did you believe in the name of God? Yes. Then according to this, you shall not perish. But instead, what do you now have? Everlasting life. Yes. Now, I said, how long is that? Is everlasting life? Is that a week? No. Is that a year? No. How long is it? It's forever. I said, now I asked you a question at the beginning of the morning. Let me ask you again. If you were to die right now, according to the Bible, where would you go? He says, I'd be going to heaven. I said, how do you know that? Because I did what the Bible said. I trusted Jesus. But again, to me, that memory that was so precious is when I looked at him and said, who'd you just talk to? And he looked at me and he honestly thought about that for a second. You know, it would have been so easy for him to say a prayer and be honest about it, but not talk to God, just say some words. You understand, our salvation comes in a person. Are you trusting in that person that you're going to heaven? Not, are you a member of a church? Do you own a Bible? Are your parents Christians? What do you title yourself? I'm asking, are you trusting the person of Jesus Christ as your personal Savior to forgive you of your sins? There is no other substitute and there is no other way than Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. For those of you who are saved, let me give you a reminder that when you deal with people, we're not pointing them to a plan, we're pointing them to a person. When we're dealing with people, we're not trying to get them to trust in religion or become a Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, whatever else. We're trying to get them to trust in Jesus. He is a real person. There is no other way. And by the way, religion is so much ingrained in every person that there are a lot of good people who are trusting in religion to get them to heaven. And let me tell you, there's a lot of good people who are going to an awful place called hell. Because they're not trusting in a person. The person of Jesus Christ. Let me warn you dear soul winner. That's what we have to point people to. It is a person. That they have to trust in. Him and him alone. There is no substitute. And when you start working with people. You'll start to pick up on this. Especially if you're paying attention. What are they trusting in. For their salvation. Are they trusting in a person. Or are they trusting in a plan? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus. And I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time 
to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.